The views and opinions expressed on any programme are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the programme and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of FRC Media, Bristol Community College or the City of Fall River. This week on FRC Media News, we speak with Fall River's incoming fire chief. The City Council rejects the sale of the Bank Street Armory and the United Way opens up its impact grant application process. All this and more coming up. It's Thursday, January 25th, 2024. This is FRC Media News. I'm Keith Tebow. Fall River will soon have a new fire chief. The City Council this week unanimously approved Mayor Paul Coogan's selection of current District Chief Jeffrey Bacon to ascend to the job when current Chief Roger St. Martin retires next month. Chief Bacon grew up in the Flint and currently lives in Somerset. He rose up through the ranks during his 20 years in the department, beginning as a firefighter, a lieutenant, and the last 10 years as district chief. He comes into the job looking to provide stability within the department. I wasn't necessarily interested right off the bat, um, but in talking with the other chiefs, um, we decided that uh, that you know it was my time. You know, someone someone steps forward to take this to, to take this role and to move the department in the future. One of the deciding factors and the determining factors really was. Um, that the department, I believe, needs continuity. In my career, there's been five fire chiefs. So um, it's tough when a new fire chief comes in, there's a new expectations, there's new rules, there's new roles for everybody. So um, to be able to really make change and significant change and lasting change, I think you, that continuity helps with that. Where, you know, I'm still gonna be the same guy eight years from now. So the guys that are getting hired right now, you know, eight years from now, it's still going to be me. So they're going to still be playing under the same rules. They're going to know what I expect. That I'm going to know what, what to expect from them. So I think it just creates a, a good level of, of, of uh, comfort uh, in the position. Chief Bacon says he looks forward to meeting with every member of the department and understand the processes of administration. He also wants to build upon the stellar reputation of what he calls one of the best fire departments in the region. We are an aggressive interior attack department. We knock down fires in their incipient stage often. You don't see us on the news a terrible uh, large amount of time because we are keeping fires small. You know, and that's really the measure for a fire department, in my opinion, um, is how much property you are saving. Lives and property saved is really the measure of a good fire department, in my opinion. And we're going to keep striving for that, and we're going to keep doing that. But that involves training. That involves equipment. That involves technology. And those are areas that I think we really need to, to move forward on and see where we can improve in those areas to keep firefighters safe and allow them to keep being an aggressive department. The chief says COVID restricted the department's ability to be an active member of the community. He looks to change that. I started coaching youth baseball when I was very young and I've been involved in sports and I think that, that a lot of that carries over to the fire department. Essentially we are one big team or a group of four smaller teams, we have four shifts. We're all pulling on the same rope but it's, it's fostering that teamwork, right? And that's where morale gets better. Uh, improving some of the quality of life in the stations is where morale gets better. And all of those things have been focuses in my career. So I, can, I plan on continuing to, to build those relationships, uh, encourage that teamwork, uh, encourage a connection with the community uh, through community service or, uh, um, or just getting the firefighters out into the community and reconnecting them with the city. I think there's been a disconnect in the last 10 years or so um, between the firefighters and the citizens of Fall River and I want to get them back out there and get their faces seen and, and get their stories told and get them helping the city in any way that we can. Other short-term goals for the chief include getting the force to its full complement of 195 firefighters and keeping apparatus up to date. He says his family has been extremely supportive of his career arc with 14-year-old son Jack potentially interested in following in his father's footsteps. 
what he really wants to do is go to Diamond and take up HVAC and be a firefighter and work on HVAC in the side. And he wants to be a Fall River firefighter. So this is pretty recently, maybe about a month or two ago, he asked me, Dad, how do I get on the Fall River Fire Department? And I said, well, you need to be a resident of Fall River for a year before you take the exam. And we started talking about it and, you know, went through the whole process. And so a few days later, I get a call from my parents. Hey, why did Jack ask if he could move in with us when he turns 17 or 18 years old? And I said, well, that's my son. And that's him planning ahead. Um, he is, when he gets his focus on something, he goes for it. And I'm, I'm proud of him for that. And, and if he ever wants to be a member of the Fall River Fire Department, I think he'd be great to have as a, as, a, as a firefighter. During our weekly interview with Mayor Paul Coogan, he says he's excited about Chief Bacon's qualifications and enthusiasm for the job. He has a lot of enthusiasm. He has a lot of ideas on how he wants to, uh, you know, change some ways of doing things in the fire department. He gave us great interviews. He was, uh, like I said, he was engaged. He seemed like he knew his stuff. Uh, he's a far over, uh, he's a far over guy, even though he lives in Somerset now. But at the same time, he um, he was the sole candidate uh, from the from the fire department. He seems like the kind of guy that wants to get his hands dirty. So, you know. We believe he can do the job. I'm very confident in his ability. And again, his ideas going forward on how he wanted to try to make um, the fire department more community engaged. Uh, you know, I perked right up when I heard that. And I, uh, I'm glad to see that that's kind of the mindset he's bringing to the job. So we'll work with him and I'm sure he'll uh, do a good job for the city of Fall River. The Fall River City Council this week voted not to sell the Bank Street Armory to a local developer looking to convert the historic building into a mix of market rate and affordable housing. The sale of the armory has been before the council since last summer, with a split among councillors who think the sale of the building is the best option to save the structure, while others want the city to retain ownership for community use. Six members voted to reject the sale, with three voting in favor. During the debate before the vote, councillor Brad Kilby urged his colleagues to approve the sale asserting the city would not have the financial resources to refurbish the armory and maintain it. In my opinion, the, you know, just to reiterate my opinion, it's clear to me. I mean, I would love if I had a magic wand to see the Bank Street Armory, what it was in the turn of the century, where it was in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s, and the 80s, we have a lot of fond memories there, but the reality is, in my opinion, um, that it's totally uh, proper to sell the building to a reputable developer who has a building right next door. Um, he has such a, a, a stake in seeing this building um, for his own portfolio to see the building re renovated. And this historic covenants on the building that are going to ensure that the facade is going to stay the same. It's just a different use. And in my opinion, it's called changing with the times. It's called progress. City Council Cliff Ponte voted against the sale, rejecting the future use of the armory, combined with uncertainties as to how much renovations would cost. I think the building should be either sold or repurposed, but I do not think housing is the ideal scenario for it. That's my opinion, based on the information that I have available to me today. I'll vote accordingly. We can call the question. <coughs> we just don't have, we're all talking in hyperbole. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows nothing. That's the reality. We know that the building's budgeted for $100,000 in electric and all this other stuff. We got a crew over here that's sitting here saying, oh, well, maybe it's 15, maybe it's 10, maybe it's eight. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. I haven't seen anything. It's not in this packet that I just received for the very first time today. Does anybody else here have any idea how much it's going to cost? All depends on who you talk to. Just exactly. like this appraisal that says this is worth zero. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's a subjective opinion, and it's, I don't agree with the use. I'm not going to support this based on the fact that I don't agree with the current intended use of what the exit strategy here is to make 36 apartments. So what's next for the Omri? Mayor Coogan tells us the administration will soon begin to explore next steps. I was kind of keen on, uh, you know, putting it back on the tax rolls, getting some, um, get a, getting a local developer who obviously did the uh, property right across the street. 
uh, to, to go in there and rehab the building, obviously saving the uh, historical significance of the uh, exterior shell, but doing some uh, innovative things on the inside to create some housing. Uh, he was going to make 20% uh, of it, I believe, affordable maybe and have a veteran's preference. So he was doing some things he did right across the street at the old um, BCC building. But the council decided they wanted to go in a di different direction, and that's that's their call. So uh, we'll see what happens going forward. The mayor says the city needs to look at its priorities when considering whether it wants to take up the task of repairing and maintaining the armory. It is with everything we do in the city of Florida. Do we want do we want to ask the taxpayers to take on that additional bill? I mean, I heard five, six hundred thousand dollars to do some temporary repairs. That's to me, I look at things in terms of that's two or three policemen, two or three firemen, maybe some teachers. That's that's how you have to look at these bills. And um, again, it may be something we end up doing. It keeps here in CPA money, but let's face it, CPA is just tax money coming in under a different name. So again, it's the taxpayers funding it. I was hoping, you know, like we did with the um, intersection that we're going to do down on the corner of Broadway and Bradford. Um, that's a Bloomberg grant. I was looking more to see if we could get some money from the private sector that may want to tie into that to help us. Um, but whatever it happens, happens, and we'll work our way through it with the council. The City Council Committee on Ordinances and Legislation this week advanced a measure that puts reasonable restrictions on panhandling across the city. Corporation Counsel Alan Rumsey advised committee members that based on previous court rulings, cities and towns cannot outright ban panhandling, but they can place sensible barriers. If it's content-based restriction, it, it will likely fail. What that means is if you don't want somebody who is homeless begging from you, but you're perfectly fine with somebody soliciting a donation for your local football team, you know, uh, then that's going to be a content-based restriction. That's generally not going to be allowed. So what this, these rules are intended to be in place for firefighters, for Girl Scouts, and for homeless people. There's no differentiation. They're all treated the same. There's time, manner, and place restrictions only. Could we have more stringent restri uh, restrictions as to certain streets? Yes. Um, that's, that's not in this yet. We could always add to certain streets that we find to be more dangerous than others. Um, I think, you know, there would probably be a little bit of research with traffic department and trying to figure out accidents and things of that nature. But what this does try to do is prevent, under the, uh, the place restriction, if you look at uh, C3, um, the person being solicited is not supposed to be in a motor vehicle. And, the, you know, the rationale behind that is a captive audience. I know, it, it, in theory, uh, somebody in a motor vehicle can drive away, but what if they're a red light and somebody approaches that window? That would be a violation of this, um, to approach each and every window within three feet of a, of a passenger in a vehicle to request for a donation. Councilors and Mayor Paul Coogan have been concerned about the rising instances of panhandling across the city. Attorney Rumsey said placing restrictions in regard to when panhandling can take place and limiting threats to residents are measures that the city can take. The council this week also approved changes to voter polling places across the city. Election Commission Chair Ryan Lyons says the moves were in response to concerns by residents of a lack of public parking at polling places. In the south end of Fall River, I want to consolidate precincts 3A and 3B, which are currently at Carlton Viveris Elementary School and Mitchell Apartments into Good Shepherd Parish. It's a large parish hall with a very large parking lot, which makes it greatly accessible to the public on Election Day, which I think is a great benefit, especially considering the densely populated neighborhoods of the, of the south end of the city. Um, heading over into the Flint section of Fall River, I want to merge um, the, the Eastwood Fire Station, Precinct 6C, and the uh, Quickishan Apartments, uh, Bishop Eat Apartments on Quickishan Street into St. Anthony's Church. Again, a beautiful facility, a large parish hall with a parking lot like the size of Gillette Stadium. Taking a tour up to the north end of the city, um, the pl my plans are to consolidate 
Um, the current precincts, um, 9A, Tansy Elementary, uh, 8C, which is Spencer Borden Elementary, and then 8B, Cardinal Madeiras Towers on Robeson Street. I want to consolidate those three polling precincts um, into Bristol Community College uh, Building G, which is the Commonwealth Student Center. And um, BCC has been a great partner. They have rolled out the red carpet to my office. I had a great meeting with them. They're going to be reserving an entire parking lot for voters. They're offering uh, rides. The security is going to be offering rides to voters um, to and from the parking lot, which is not a great distance, but just in case of somebody, an elderly voter, a handicapped voter requires assistance getting from their car into the building, they're going to be offering um, assistance on election day. Um, they are going to be putting signs right from the entrance on Elsby Street, guiding voters all the way to the parking lot. I know there are some students who are looking forward to um, having a table set up and helping voters on election day. So there's a lot more to come on that, but that's what's going to be happening up in the north end of the city. And again, voters will be receiving um, a letter in the mail with their change of polling precinct information from my office. The new polling places will take effect beginning with the March 5th presidential primary. The elections office is also mailing out the city's annual census forms to residents. Take a look at the form. If anything has to be corrected, a name, an addition to your household, a date of birth, an occupation, make the correction, sign the form, and return it to the Board of Elections office as soon as possible. There is an envelope enclosed. You only have to put a stamp on it, and there are drop boxes um, listed on the back of your census form. They're at Shaw Supermarket, Stop and Shop on Mariona Bishop Boulevard, uh, Shaw Supermarket, Seabra Supermarket, and Market Basket is the new addition this year. But the census is critically important for a number of reasons. One, we do want to keep an up-to-date street listing for the city of Fall River. That is critically important, especially when it comes to the formula funding. There are so many different public and private agencies that will offer grants to the city of Fall River. In addition to that, a, an enormous portion of our municipal budget is based upon revenues coming in from the Commonwealth and federal government. That's for after-school programs. That's for infrastructure programs coming into this funding coming into the city. Um, it's for services for senior citizens. It's for veterans um, benefits. So it's critically important for residents to, re to comply with the annual municipal census um, as soon as possible. Residents who fail to complete the city census will risk having their voter status put on hold for this fall's elections. Massachusetts Governor Maura Healey this week unveiled her FY 2025 state budget that takes effect in July. The governor says the $56.1 billion spending plan is balanced and responsible with targeted investments. It protects and advances the progress we made this past year, fully funding the next phase of our historic tax cuts. Tax cuts that save money for residents across this state. It continues free breakfast and lunch. It preserves no-cost community college for students 25 and older through Mass Reconnect, which will strengthen our workforce and is something our employers are counting on. This budget also offers new investments to keep lowering household costs and strengthening our schools, our businesses, and our communities. It will fund Gateway to Pre-K, our plan to make child care affordable to thousands of families across Massachusetts, while setting us on an important path to universal Pre-K in all 26 cities and beyond. We'll have more FRC Media News right after this. Here are some job descriptions on the latest hot jobs list from the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center. Buyer, Blount Fine Foods, located at 630 Current Road, is looking for a full-time buyer to plan, coordinate, analyze, and manage all activities related to the purchasing and receipt of assigned raw materials. Job number 2030690. Group Home Direct Care Staff Associate, Old Colony Fall River YMCA, located at 353 Lincoln Avenue, is seeking a part-time Group Home Direct Care Staff Associate to ensure that all young adult clients receive professional, safe care in a well-maintained and secure Group Home environment. Job number 2030035. 
Director of Human Resources, Crystal Springs Incorporated, located at 256 Albany Street, seeks a full-time Director of Human Resources, responsible for overseeing all human resources operations within the residential facility for individuals with disabilities. Job number 202-99998. Sandwich Artist, Subway, located at 79 President Avenue, is looking for a full-time sandwich artist. For more information, call 774-955-5048. Diamond Regional Vocational Technical High School, located at 251 Stonehaven Road, has an immediate need for the following full and part-time positions. Long-term substitute teacher. Job number 2030365. Cooperative Education Coordinator. Job number 2030173. For more information about these or other positions, visit Mass Hire Job Quest at jobquest.dcs.ol.mass.gov or call the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center at 508-730-5000. Welcome back. Beginning this weekend, riders of the Southeastern Regional Transit Authority will once again be able to ride the bus on Sunday. Everywhere I've gone, every person I've talked to, whenever I've told them what it is that I do, where I work, uh, the first question, if they're a rider of service or a previous rider of our service is, why doesn't the bus run on Sundays? And you know, for a long time, that's been a difficult question to answer, other than the fact that simply funding didn't allow for it. Um, but uh, in this legislative session, we are very fortunate to have uh, the allocation of the fair share funding uh, coming to the regional transit authorities. And that funding is gonna provide us enough uh, in order to pilot uh, Sunday service for the remainder of this fiscal year, which we're very excited about. Uh, and that service is gonna mirror what we operate on Saturdays, which we think is important again for communicating to our customers what the expectations should be. Um, you know, our customers are already riding on Saturdays. They understand the schedule, the span, uh, the timing. Uh, so it'll be a, a, a simple addition to their lives to be able to, to, to go to their worship services, shopping service, shopping uh, that they'd like to go to, uh, see family and loved ones on Sundays, just like they can any other day of the week. Um, but all, all too often, it's been overlooked as something that wasn't necessary. But uh, on the South Coast, we have a seven, week, seven day a week economy and we need seven day a week service. The unemployment rate in the city of Fall River rose sharply in December of 2023. The jobless rate sits at 5.5%, up from 4.1% in November. The city's unemployment rate a year ago in December was 5.6%. Jobless rates also rose in the suburbs surrounding Fall River and other gateway cities in the region. The state's unemployment rate also rose last month three-tenths of a point to 3.2%. The United Way of Greater Fall River has announced that it's launched its annual impact grant application process. The United Way expects to provide a total of $175,000 in money to nonprofit organizations with up to $10,000 in funding to each awardee. The impact grant pool of funding is specifically for or targeted for new and innovative programming. Um, because it is a smaller uh, or a smaller cap for the grants, we're really looking to either provide an opportunity with some seed money for a new project or a service that is identified a, a gap and is filling that gap or need. However, that being said, we do have some programs and services that have received impact grants for several years. Um, they're, they're still making an impact, they're moving the needle, they're showing uh, propensity for change. Um, and so, you know, this, this grant fund might represent uh, a match or it might represent just that, that, that gap that they need to get over the hump. Uh, they're not intended to fund an entire program or project. They're meant to really endorse collaboration with others, uh, fill those gaps in services. And the key factor is that they're going to align with our uh, pillars of focus, education, health, and financial stability. The application process opened up last week and will end by the middle of February. It's a broad range of health and human services organizations. We've had anything from, you know, equine assisted therapy to surf therapy programs. Um, just anything that's a, a you know, small, innovative program that could just use that extra funding and extra bump. 
It's been super impactful for helping them to, to get their programs off the ground and to help them build um, capacity to, um, to continue their efforts going forward. You can go online to our impact grant portal. You'll find it under the impact grants uh, tab and uh, the application deadline runs through February 12th at 5 p.m. Um, and we'll be reviewing those um, applications in the following two weeks with a volunteer group uh, a panel of community members. Impact grant funding will be made available to recipients sometime this summer. We'll wrap up this edition of FRC Media News after this. Hi everyone, welcome to Hot Dogs and Cool Cats. With me I have Thicken Nugget. Thicken is a four-year-old, oh you're fine, stop it's a camera, a four-year-old chihuahua mix. Thicken was an owner surrender just because of just situational problems. He is definitely a little sweetheart, just a little nervous right now. Definitely with you know newer people, he can be very shy. So if you are interested in coming to meet Thicken, you're definitely going to want to schedule a few appointments just because it takes him a little while to come out of his shell. Children were saying 12 and up. He'd rather be picked up and carried, but he will walk on the leash. He's definitely more of the I come to you when I want to, um, not you come to me. Uh, but then when he comes to you, he does love his snuggles. Um, he wants to be very much reassured um, that everything is okay. You can schedule an appointment with us at Forever Paws Animal Shelter at 300 <laughs> Linwood Street in Fall River, Mass. And meet Thicky. Today with us we have Priyanka. Uh, she is a, a three-year-old uh, domestic medium hare. Um, she is a female. She was an owner's surrender, um, no fault of her own. Um, just wanted to give her a better, a better chance at life. A super cuddle buggy, kind of, she's playful, but she's also a lap cat. Um, even this whole time I've been holding her, she's just been purring. Uh, she likes her snacks. She would probably do good in any kind of a home, um, whether you're quiet, whether you're active, if you have kids, if you don't have kids, she's pretty easy going. She just loves to be pet, especially on the cheeks. So if you want to come down and uh, meet Priyanka, um, I know she'll love to meet you. Um, you can give a call to make an appointment at Forever Paws Animal Shelter. Um, we also have all of our contact information on our site as well at foreverpaws.com. Come on down and meet Priyanka. That's all for this edition of FRC Media News. Please visit our website, frmedia.org, for all the latest news and local information. FRC Media News airs Thursdays at 6 p.m. and Fridays at 5.30 p.m. For all of us here at FRC Media News, I'm Keith Tebow. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next Thursday. Thank <laughs> you.